Welcome. Thank you all for being here, and it's wonderful to see so many of you at this point in the day, because I know many of you have been very busy. <laughs> and because this is going to be an exceptionally fun session, I want to get on with it. So I'm Leanne Potter. I direct the Office of Learning and Innovation at the Library of Congress, and I am thrilled to be able to welcome you to this session entitled, How to Raise a Reader. Sound like a good idea? Awesome. OK, um, I have some remarks I need to read. And I'm going to read them sort of verbatim so we can keep going. Um, I already said that part. And now I'm going to say this. I, I'm going to tell you about something. I was walking across from the Apple store. And I heard about a 10-year-old young man say to his mom, hey, mom, do you have our tickets? And they were heading into this building. And his mom said, we don't need them. The book festival is free, and you don't need tickets. And he said, that's cool. I was like, yeah, that is cool. And the reason that is cool is because the National Book Festival is generously supported by a number of organizations and individuals, and we are very grateful to them, not the least of which is the National Endowment for the Arts, who is our sponsor, right? And I think that we had a colleague from the endowment who is going to be here to give everybody a high five. I hope he's still around. So thank you to the endowment. And also thank you, of course, to David Rubenstein, who is a very generous supporter of the National Book Festival. If you, too, want to be part of that group and wish to make a donation, please do so on the festival app under the word donate on the home page. We really do appreciate your support for this great celebration of books and reading. And I need to emphasize this uh, program is not supported by appropriated dollars. It is, do it is supported by donated dollars. So it's a really awesome day for a number of reasons. We hope this day inspires you to make use of the incomparable resources of the Library of Congress. And remember that it is not just Congress's library. Whose library is it? That's right, it is our national library, and it is in our best interest to make the best use of it. We are thrilled to announce that the library's brand new National Book Festival Presents series, which will extend the reach of this festival with even more exciting book events at the library throughout the year, will begin next month. Please check the library's website at loc.gov for updates on all of the programming, and we really hope that you will take advantage of that programming, not just at the library, but also on the library's many social media channels, on our YouTube channel, and on the library's website for live streaming. Um, we will welcome your questions at the end of this presentation. If you have a question, Please make it brief and to the point. We love your life stories, but come on. <laughs> All right. And finally, can you turn off your cell phones or at least mute them so that you're not that person? <laughs> All right. Um, now, now I get to introduce these people. Um, I already said that. I already said that. It's my pleasure. Okay. So we have with us today. <laughs> we have with us Maria Russo, and we have Pamela Paul, we have Linda Sue Park, we have John Cheska, and we also have Renee Wilson. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, and then we're going to get the conversation started. So um, I'm going to start right here next to me with Maria. Maria Russo is the children's book editor of the New York Times Book Review. She's been a writer and editor at the Los Angeles Times. The New York Observer, and Salon. She holds a PhD in English and comparative literature from Columbia University. You can go ahead and clap. <laughs> All right. Pamela is the editor of the New York Times Book Review and oversees book coverage at the Times, which she joined in 2011 as the children's book editor. Sound familiar? <laughs> they sort of work together, which is great. It's great for all of us. We also have with us Linda Seuss Park, who I have to say, I love her, her URL because it's L Spark. And I just think Spark says all kinds of things. Um, Linda was speaking earlier today, and many of you may have seen her. She was talking about her new book, Naya's Long Walk, A Step at a Time. But there's a great story, and I think it's on the library's app for the book festival as well. And oh, you have the book right there. That's cool. Um, um, nice. There's a story that says that when Linda was, Linda's first published piece was a haku that she got published in a children's magazine when she was nine years old. And she was paid a dollar for it. And she framed the check, and she's never cashed it. <laughs> I love that. Good. OK. 
Um, John Cheska was the first national ambassador for young people's literature in 2008 and 2009. Thank you. The ambassador program is a program of the Library of Congress and the Children's Book Council. Among his many books, and I know that there are people in the room who know this already, among his many books are The Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairy Stupid Tales. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> you know you've got a following. Now. I love it. Um, as well as the true story of the three little pigs. John was speaking earlier. Yeah. <laughs> John was speaking earlier today about a new book entitled Astronauts Mission One, The Plant Planet. Um, he's been working with illustrator Steven Weinberg on it. And finally, but certainly not least of all, is Renee. Renee Watson is the New York Times best-selling author of Piecing Me Together, This Side of Home, and What Mama Left Me. She has also two acclaimed picture books, A Place Where Hurricanes Happen, and Harlem's Little Blackbird, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. She is the founder of the I2 Arts Collective, a nonprofit committed to nurturing underrepresented voices in the creative arts. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. We have a marvelous panel to talk about how to raise a reader. And I'm hopeful that this really will be a conversation. And at about 5.45, um, so in about 30 minutes or so, we will stop the conversation up here because we really do want to hear from all of you. So be thinking as they're talking about the kinds of questions that, that you have on your minds that you'd like to hear from them. Um, my role in the conversation is just to keep it moving and make sure everybody has a chance to say something brilliant because, of course, we're recording this for later webcasting. Can we tell our life stories? They, uh, no, you may not, <laughs> unless it has well, that to do with was, raising a reader. I thought that was just for the audience. OK, so, so how to raise a reader. Um, have any of you, and by the way, I love involving the audience. And I'm going to do that by asking people to raise their hands. Are you guys good with that? If you say yes, raise your hand. Then you know they're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. All right. Raise your hand if you've ever tried to raise something. Raise something. All right. Ooh. OK, when we raise something, I would venture to suggest that when we raise something, it's because we value it. And so I'm going to ask our panelists to start our conversation there with, what is it about reading that you value or that you find valuable? Go ahead. I'll start. <laughs> reading for me is the best way to stay in touch with myself and my own inner life at the same time as I'm staying in touch with the world around me. And I love that doubleness. It's inside mm -hmm. me, but it's also a great connection to the rest of the world. Love it, staying in touch. So in a book club that I have that only reads children's books, even though there are no children in that book club, we once got into an argument over a YA novel. Half the group hated it, the other half loved it. And in the middle of the argument, one of the members who is a child psychologist said, I think that the reason our opinions about this book differ so much is that we're reading for different reasons. And so she went around the group and she said, why do you read? And it was a really interesting question because you would think that we would all know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. We were all readers, but it took us a while. And I think when it came to me, I, I think our answers sort of change over time. But for me, it's mostly about reading is a way to be transported and to be in another person's shoes, to see through another lens. I know there are some people who say, like, I'd like to see my own experience reflected in books, and I'm the opposite of that. The last thing I want to do is read a book about you know, a full-time working mother of three, <laughs> um, <laughs> commuting every day. Um, I want to read to experience something that I never would otherwise understand, see, get to know good. in my regular life. Love it. Linda yeah. Sue. Escape. Escape. <laughs> nice. <laughs> From whatever. <laughs> so, um, and you know the reasons that you also said, you know, um, that it's something for your head and your heart. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm more like Pamela. I read to get out of my own head. Like I don't want any more like to be in that. I would love to hear what other people think, yeah. how other people live, yeah. um, and not just someone who agrees with me. Mm. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think about reading. I read because I want to 
uh, travel the world. I want to learn about other people, but I do want to see myself. I didn't get to see myself a lot when I was younger. So especially now, I'm so intrigued by all the books that are out that are reflections of my childhood, neighborhoods that I'm familiar with. Um, yeah, I always say reading is like the amen corner at a black Baptist church when, <laughs> when everyone's just like, amen. And you're like, yes, I feel this. I agree. I, it, this resonates with me. So yeah, reading is, is an, um, I am acting with the author and saying amen and nodding my head and underlining things. And oh, that's special. The this Baldwin, is... we think we're alone in the world. Yeah. And then we read. Oh, this is good. Okay, so we all read, and you're gonna raise your hands when you agree, okay? How many of you agree that we read to stay in touch, whether with ourselves or with somebody else, okay? How about to be transported, to escape, sort of in the same vein? Yeah. Um, how about to travel the world? Awesome. How about to see yourself? And how about to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh, this was good. This is really good. Okay, now this means we do value reading, right? Mm. And so, of course, we want to raise readers. Now we got to talk about the adjectives because I noticed that the title of the book is How to Raise a Reader, not any particular kind of reader. So let's talk about the kinds of readers. What kinds of readers do we want to raise? Sure. Anybody? <laughs> Well, I th why, you all looked at me. Yeah, <laughs> Renee's got the answer. Amen. <laughs> uh, so I think about the young people that I've taught, and I'm always asking them to be critical thinkers, right? Yeah. You can love something, but I want to know why you love it, and I want you to be able to critique even the things you love. Um, so when I'm thinking about raising readers, I'm thinking about raising critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. I like inspired readers. Um, I taught second grade for quite a while. And I had this room of knuckleheads, and you had to like engage them, or you, they weren't going to be readers. So I think that's part of what inspired me to write the weirdest thing possible, yeah. to have that person in the back of the room going like, what did he just say? Yeah. Like, did he really <laughs> say that? Yeah. I think I love it. for Maria and me, one of the most important things, I mean, correct me if I'm, is that we want to raise readers who are happy readers, who are reading for pleasure, for the joy of it, because everyone has to read, right? They know that, they learn that in school, um, but not everybody has to want to read. And so we want to, we want to raise kids who read because they choose to read, because it brings them pleasure. So you want voluntary readers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And passionate readers. A kid this. who chooses a book and can't wait to get back to that book when they're forced to stop, when it's dinner time, they have to yeah. take a break and they can't wait to get back to it. That feeling of, how does it end? And I just want a few eager, more pages. Eager readers. Eager and passionate Love it. readers. Any other kinds of readers? Um, I think that two of the attributes of young people that we sometimes lose as we get older are curiosity and enthusiasm. And I think that reading is one way to foster that and keep it going. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, I just, I'm so, I'm so, I've had it, I'm done with jaded people. I'm done with people who are just too cool for school, you know? Uh, give me some enthusiasm, some curiosity, yeah. mm -hmm. some, you know, some of that sort of uh, passionate spark. seeking. Yeah, the spark. Like, yeah. <laughs> you got it in there. It's not fair, it's her name. <laughs> So that, I mean, that's the kind of reader, you know, that I, that I was, that I hope I still am, and that, um, that I think we all write our books mm -hmm. yeah. to, to, yeah. Uh, to encourage. Yeah. And I think the greatest part of the book that these two have put together is that self-motivated reader. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Pamela, you just wrote that great article on don't, don't give out ribbons for reading or don't punish people for not reading. Don't do either one of those things. Mm -hmm. Like let kids be inspired to be their own choosers, their own readers, their own, give, them, give themselves their own ribbon. Yeah. Like they don't need that's a ribbon perfect. from us. That's yeah. Perfect. And that's one of those points we make in the book that comes from the heart and our experience, but also comes from science and research, right? <laughs> yeah. The research into yeah. intrinsic motivation. Mm. When someone is doing something because they chose it, it's more meaningful, they're more likely to form a habit, yep. which is what we want. We want kids to have a habit of reading. And when it's extrinsic motivation, when they're reading because it's their homework or because their parent says, you have to read 10 pages before you can go out, that's not helping to create a passionate reader. That's 
extrinsic motivation. And we like intrinsically motivated readers. We want to back off that yeah. reward and punishment system yeah. and create these readers that do it because it's, it's what they do. And Can we say, talk trash about bad habits or bad programs? <laughs> if you you know, like those to, accelerated reader programs yeah. Uh, yeah. of teaching <laughs> Those are terrible. I mean, Maria, because they've proven that's the yes. science. Like it's kids will like read to get the prizes, mm. and then yeah. as soon as they don't have it, it they drop off. Or and then they're not readers, right? On the other side, the reading log, where yep. the, you have to write the book that you read, and you have to write out the whole title and the author and how many pages yeah. and how long you spent. We we took a very controversial position in this book which is that we're against teachers giving reading logs to their, to their classes because it turns it into a rote exercise. It turns Fine. it into something the child is doing for an adult eye to approve mm. of or, or to time the time. One of my children once had to write how many minutes they read yeah. every day, and that's all the kind of stuff that we think just starts to associate reading with stuff that doesn't feel so good for a kid. The other thing I would say is that I think that these ideas that we're talking about are especially important for kids who are reluctant readers, who are not necessarily mm -hmm. the best readers, because they know that. They, they know that, they're aware of where they their peers are They don't need to be reminded of it, right? They don't need to be reminded, they don't need to be told, like, that book is too easy for you, or that's a graphic novel, not a real book, or that's, you know, not your level. Mm -hmm. They need to find that positive side in it because they're already getting a very negative message. Yeah. And I think that just as we, we accept that all readers are different, that we like different things, and that that's okay. And what I found in my, you know, years of school visits is that, um, all reluctant readers are different. Mm. They don't yeah. like to read for all different right. reasons. And yeah. so to lump them sort of all together to say this is a reluctant reader, well, this is a reader who responds more to images in books, so graphic novels. This is a reader who loves exposition, not narrative. So those, yeah. those DK right. books that drive me crazy, they love, you know. <laughs> right, um, right. And so that, you know, um, I'm, I'm sort of myself trying to get away from that concept of the reluctant reader. Right. And just, yep. it's more like the reader who hasn't found the hasn't book. Right. Right. reluctant right. to read that book. Right. Not yes. Yes. Right. And I think, I mean, it's about seeing our young people as individuals, right? Yeah. And if I'm a teacher, hopefully I'm asking questions. And I want to know why. Why don't you like this book? Why didn't you finish it? Why is this right. hard or boring? And really get to know my students so that I can find the right book for them and help them find um, what they like. Because, I, I, yeah, I think it's about making sure young people have choice and that they see themselves as capable yes. of, of finishing something, um, even if it takes them longer than it takes their classmate, that it's okay to read. I'm a slow reader. I like to, like, sit with words and let them sink in. And so I think that's part of it, too, is letting kids be the individuals that they are. We could probably just get rid of that term reluctant. Yeah. I had a little yeah. kid in a signing line whose parents introduced him as a reluctant uh, reader. Mm. And he, I love him for this. He yeah. said, no, I'm not. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, I'm a picky awesome. reader. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. the best yeah. reader. Yeah. I love it. I love it. See, I'm not just going to read this. anything. This, is, this could be yeah. like yeah. volume two of your book, I think, yeah. because yeah. everything you've said about There's something else we should note with what Renee is saying, we're at a moment when there are so many different kinds of children's books being published. Mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah. world of children's books has opened. Really There's more diverse books than mm -hmm. there have ever been. There's nonfiction, the fact books. Those DK books aren't the only yep. thing that a fact-loving child can find now to mm -hmm. read. There's great nonfiction. The graphic novel revolution yeah. has put visual readers into this extravaganza environment. Yeah. Wordless so, We just had so Raina Telgemeier right on the main stage just yep. packing them in. These are real yeah. books. These are mm -hmm. great And audio books. books. Audio, audio books, too, books for are kids who are dyslexic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> this is all And good. poetry. So yeah, I was lucky, speaking of lucky yeah. readers, I was really lucky because my colleague, Maria Rana, who puts together all of the amazing authors that come to the book festival, she gave me a preview copy of their book that is now hot off the press. So I got to read it in advance. Mm. And so all of these ideas about the kinds of readers we really would love to raise and how do we get there are exactly what's in your book. And so I love that the conversation started turning to sort of what motivates readers because part of that is what, motivated, what motivates writers. Mm. And so in your case, what motivated you guys to write this book? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about the approaches you took within it 
And we're still good on time. This is so far so good. Well, as you know, we, we both have three children. Pamela's children are here. <laughs> uh, mine are back home in New Jersey. But um, so we have, we're moms and we work with books every day. We're, we're so lucky. And we just both, when we had the opportunity to do this for the New York Times as a digital guide, we had such a response. We had so many people saying, um, how can I print this out? And um, you can't print it out, it yeah. was a, a digital thing. <laughs> when will it be a book? So it just seemed natural. We both realized we wish we had this book. You know, when my first child was born, I didn't even know what a board book was versus a picture book, and I'm a book person. Yeah. So we just thought there's a lot of information and, and then just support. We both have this, these ideas about taking reading away from the rote and the homework side and bringing it into a, a child's passion. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that exactly what Maria said. And then the other thing is for us, it was kind of the perfect combination of being a passion and a mission yeah. because we both feel like this is extremely important, yeah. um, but world. also this yeah. is really fun. And when we were working on the digital guide, um, it was kind of on top of our regular jobs. Um, so we didn't have a lot of time with it. But when we got into the conference room to do it, we're like, oh my God, this is so much fun. This is yes. so great. Thank I wish you. we could do this all day. So it felt like when that was done and it had to be shrunk down um, to appear in the digital guide, we left like half of it on the cutting room floor. It felt like a natural There's, there's so much more to say. And then the more we started writing and talking to people and looking at the research, the more we said like, this is a topic that people are hungry for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially right now with all of the other distractions that um, parents are up against in their children's lives. Yeah. We need to make the case that reading can become just as much of a, of a habit right. and just as big a part exactly of a kid's right. life as, as other forms of entertainment. I mean, it's interesting because in, in one respect, half of our work was done, which is that everyone out there, I think everyone in this room, you already know that reading is important. You know that it's important not just for your child's academic success, but for their social and emotional development, for executive function, for just being a full, fully engaged citizen in the world, and that it's important and that it's good to be a reader. And I have to say that sounds very basic right now, but in the 70s and the 80s when I was growing up, like it was actually not something to show off about to have to be a reader. You know, you were instead you were a bookworm. You know, you were bookish, you were nerdy, you were dorky. You were supposed to be sort of out at recess catching balls or playing gymnastics or playing the violin, doing gymnastics or playing the violin. You were supposed to have some other kind of skill. Nobody showed off about how good a reader their kid was. That just wasn't something to highlight. And now people do. So everyone has that message. But I think that. That also creates a lot of anxiety and pressure for people. That now they know it's important, so they don't exactly know, well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you organized your book from, from, you know, essentially before a child's even born, up through their, their teenage years, and you've provided some things. This is what you need to know. And do you want to talk a little bit about that sort of, you know, I think well, it's first almost we, we cognitive should, development in a way, too. But we should say the reason it starts before your child is born is because we're encouraging parents to do their own reading, to keep their own reading life going what, before your baby arrives and then afterward, because it's really important for kids to see their parents yeah, modeling, modeling yeah. reading, and also just for yourself. As a parent, it's really hard as, you know, we talk about this a lot with the reading, like it's hard to be like, you have to read 20 minutes today and then go back to your phone. <laughs> you know, it's a little yeah. easier. <laughs> it's sure. book. I'm reading, I'm reading. <laughs> if you're reading too. So we do mm -hmm. start with the parent and becoming a reader and having yeah. a home where people talk about books. Yeah. And books are an exciting thing to, to get from the library or to get as a gift. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we wanted to have it run from the very beginning all the way up through teenage years is that people will often focus on reading during that panic moment of like, oh my God, it's kindergarten, it's first grade, my kid isn't reading up to level, what do I do, right? Yeah. Um, but the truth is, and Maria and I have both experienced this in our role at the New York Times, is that we often hear from people who have 10-year-olds, who have 12-year-olds or 15-year-olds, and they're like, oh my God, my kid was so into reading, and now he stopped. I would say it's the 10 and 11-year-old, and you yeah. guys could probably speak to this too, that, that we get the most panicky questions mm -hmm. about that their the, interest has that waned. That they, they used to read so much right. or they used to love books and I'm not, I'm not. Yeah, and the other thing that. that we wanted to emphasize is that it's never too late. 
We talk to authors all the time who, you know, you would think that they all grew up reading. Not necessarily. I mean, last night we heard from uh, Casey uh, Gerald, who uh, didn't read until after college for fun. Um, so you can become a reader at any stage. Um, the earlier, the better, obviously. Um, but we wanted to emphasize that it's never too late. Yeah. Or Dave <laughs> Pilkey, Captain Underpants, is that guy who got kicked right. out of every class. That's right. And that's and how made he his became comics out in the hallway. Exactly. The illustrations <laughs> began. I yeah. saw a gentleman at the book festival earlier today who had a t-shirt on that said, so many books, so little time. Mm -hmm. And that certainly speaks to what you're saying about, you know, it's never too late, but the sooner you begin, mm -hmm. the better, you, better off you are. Especially right? for us mm -hmm. slow readers. Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah. when I was a kid, so when I would tell my mother, I'm bored, she would say, go read a book. Yeah. And yeah. I would be like, oh, whatever, you know. And, I'd go, and then I'd get caught up in the story and all this time would pass and I was loving reading. And I saw my mother read, like you were saying, I think yeah. she modeled reading to us, like we always saw her, even if it was her Bible yeah. or a magazine, the newspaper, she always had something that she was reading. So it was just the norm in our family that that was the dinner conversation was what are you reading and what are you watching? It's like, what stories are you taking in? Yeah. Um, and what do you think about those stories? So I think that that's important to have our young people read and then also have conversations yes. about what they're reading. Um, I think that's important too. Yeah. And that's well, the that's the best thing about include. this entire yeah. audience is like yeah. they've done step one, like be the role model. <laughs> that's exactly Because getting right. boys to read, which I've worked on for a ton too, is that same thing. Yeah. Like they often don't see dads reading at mm -hmm. home. Dads are doing their business and then they come home. And it's like, oh, let mom read. It's like really little things like that. Like we're telling kids reading's important for everybody. And then the elementary kids look around and go like, but why do we have lady teachers? <laughs> like one little guy yeah. asked me that. Yeah. I said, how come all the librarians are ladies? Yeah. I went, well, let's look into that. Yeah. Let's think about that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's a good question. It is a good question. I think also that even though all readers are very different, and there's picky readers too, yeah. there is one question that every reader asks of every single book without exception when they open it, and that's, what's in this for me? Yeah. Yeah. What's in this for me? And so, as a parent or an authority figure, teacher, whatever, trying to get kids to read, you do need to get to know them as individuals. Right? Yeah. And that's the problem with reading programs, is that you're trying to te te teach all 20 children as if they're the same. Whereas the answer to what's in this for me is different for every child, and therefore your approach to them needs to be individualized, which you can do as parents. Right? Find out the answer of when they open a book, what do they want in here for me? Mm -hmm. you know? And that's why there's not that one book for everybody. And I always wished as a kid, I remember thinking, like, I wish someone would just tell me, like, those five books you should read. <laughs> like, I thought that was out there somewhere. I was going to say, and in your book, that was a big question for me, is you do include ex suggestions yeah. oh, on books yeah. that, that uh, you know, that are ones that you think that you're recommending. That was the hardest I bet that was the hardest. Yeah, and that was the question was, yeah. how hard was that? Was that what narrowing really ended it down. up on the floor? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what was your criteria? That was very yeah. brave and did you arm wrestle that also? <laughs> right. There's a lot of debate. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's one of the nice things about having two authors, right? We have two mm. sensibilities, two points of yeah. view. Good. You know, Pamela is more of a different kind of reader. She likes fantasy. I don't love fantasy quite as much. Yeah. So we, you know, for example, that's just one example. So I felt between the two of us, we give you a really pretty good range mm -hmm. uh -huh. of yeah. uh, what's out there. Uh -huh. I mean, what's interesting is that we, both of us read different books growing up, right? We have each have three children, all of whom are different readers from each other. And we were both the children's books editor during different periods, Maria still is. So we had all these different points of encounter with children's books and then, you know, then looking out at everything that's coming out um, so what was hard right. is that what we wanted to do in the book is not just have kind of the best, because that's impossible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we, who we, you know, who, who, it would be impossible to decide, and there would be things inevitably left, let out, but to talk about the ones that we were the most enthusiastic about, mm -hmm. because that's yeah. what and that I think. And that we've seen kids really respond yeah. to. Yeah. Yep. And then in the end, we have an appendix where we talk about different kinds of books for different sort of reasons. Books that make you laugh, books that are about friendship, books that are about bravery or about teamwork. And that was really hard. I have to say there was lots of like, like trading places of books, you know, like this yeah, one really should go on friendship. Especially now, right, there's so many books on a lot of these themes, yeah, like kindness is. and empathy, yeah. you know, is, is exploding. There's so many books about it. So um, 
you know, when we wanted to have a balance, we did want to include some classics. You know, we talk about the problems with a lot of classics. Don't, they haven't held up that well. You know, you yeah. read them now and you're like, yeah. ooh. Um, <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, yeah. So we did, but we did, but there are some classics that, uh, that, you know, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble, I just, you know, that book meant everything to me when yeah. I was a child and I wanted to be able awesome. to suggest that for kids today. So that was also the balancing. But I love that as a great parent experience too. I have a new granddaughter, and my one of my favorite books is The Carrot Seed. Oh yeah. And I read that to her, and it just flopped. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. nothing yeah. happens. It's just like page turn after page. Oh, it didn't grow up. It didn't grow up. It didn't grow up. But I love the punchline at the end. It's a I giant know, carrot, yes. but she didn't I wait for it. She's just like, yeah. this book is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more like you. I'm, we had a, we had the same debate about the carrots. One of the oh, important sure. points that we make about books is that there's not only the right book for the right child, but also at the right moment. Yeah. And that yeah, there might be good. a time where that yeah. book isn't appealing, and then yep. mm -hmm. two years later, they're interested in that book. That's perfect. And it's one all of the, about that punchline. Yeah. 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 And so one of the things that I think is great is not only for you to go to the library or to the bookstore with your child and let them pick things out, but also bring them an array of things, because they might not necessarily know what they're interested yeah. in. Yeah. And you bring home 10 different kinds of books. It's really interesting to find out like which one your child grabs gravitates towards because that helps you know sort of what kind of reader. And isn't about. that true? I mean, choice is what empowers us as readers. I love going to friends' houses and looking oh, yeah. at their oh, books. That's the best. Like, that's as yeah. good yeah. as looking in the drug. Oh, we shouldn't say that right now. In the medicine cabinet? Is that bad? So <laughs> you get a good read on people, so right? <laughs> One question I get asked a lot that you do address in the book is um, I'm often asked by parents about device versus paper book. And, um, Oh. You know, again, your individual child, and there's some children and some readers for whom that device works really well. But there is brain science to show that we actually read differently on a device than we do a paper book, and that yeah. a paper book allows for deeper engagement. Yeah. So if you know that the only way your child will read is on a device, then they should read on a device. But if they don't have that single exception, then have books available everywhere, mm -hmm. because that critical thinking that Renee was talking about happens at a deep thinking brain level, which is much easier to reach with a paper book than it is with a screen. And a book's a great portable device. Yes. <laughs> it's, I would say it's a yeah. yeah. no portable kind device. Amazing. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's awesome. I love, we at the library love that. That's yeah. fabulous. Um, I, one of my, I have, you know how you read a book, and of course, you're not supposed to have favorites of everything, but I absolutely have a favorite strategy, and it comes in the chapter on toddlers, I think. And it's the suggestion um, about building a child's own bookshelf. Oh, yeah. 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 You want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to go first? <laughs> Why don't you go first? My oh, kids okay. are in the front row and oh, they can right. hold me okay. accountable because <laughs> I'm okay. always trying to, like, the, when their bookshelves become too crowded, yes. to weed them out and yeah. they get very upset if oh, I take yeah. the books yes. away so oh. yeah. quickly. Oh, and, and fun, that's funny because I am slightly the opposite. I'm always putting more books on yeah. my kid's shelf, and my youngest, who's nine now, just finally called a halt and did his own edit of his bookshelves, and I was so proud wow. to see. Nice. And, I, and it was showing me, okay, this is who this kid is. It had, of course, all the dog man books, all the wimpy kid books, yeah. but he also had, he kept a couple of the picture books that we especially loved from when he was little, yeah. um, The Storm Whale, which is one of my favorites. All the Mo Willems, Knuffle Bunny books. Yes. Um, and then he's a fact book guy. So then it had his book of presidents. It had his sports nice. statistic books yeah. and his atlas. That's another thing that yeah. people should, yeah. you know, all of these are books. Mm -hmm. like so you've already taken a picture of, of the bookshelf. Oh, did I say and that? No, I'm oh, saying this I, is what you need to do next. Take that picture I did. and then, good. I thought I sent it to you. <laughs> no, but I love that. that. I was, I was thinking, how can I use If we do that, this? yes. Yeah. And then we get these literally snapshots of the, of the of, child's Of the influences and the, the opinions. Right. And the, exactly. And, this, and so yeah. even for babies and toddlers, having their own shelf is a really important way to yes. show that, that you value their reading and that this is a place for them to express themselves and it's their comfort Reflection. spot. And yeah. Yeah. Their books are their comfort <laughs> objects when they're babies and toddlers. Right. I mean, one of the things to Linda's point about the physical book is that, first of all, surveys show that most kids, even teenagers, prefer physical books to e-books, which is great, but kids are also collectors and they, and they like things that belong to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important, Marie and I emphasis that, emphasize this in the book, that even if you don't have, even if the child doesn't have his or her own room, but share a room with siblings or with parents, that there's some place there that is even if it's his one spot shelf. for books and that those books belong to him. Yeah, yeah. I like it. 
All right, I'm looking at my watch and I think it's about time for us to open up some questions from all of you. And I wanna point out that we have two microphones, one here and one here. And if you line up on both sides, I'll just alternate in terms of where the questions are coming from. And I think you're first. Hi everybody, you guys are like an all-star panel to me. I love the New York Times and all, my mom's a children's librarian, so I'm familiar with all three of your books. So oh, no choice. I've been waiting for this panel all day. Um, my question is, uh, my question is, is um, when I go on dates with other young men, none of them are readers. So will there be a sequel? And what would you say for the twenty-something? The twenty-something. <laughs> <laughs> the dating guide. The dating How to get twenty-somethings back into reading? Oh, you know, will there be a sequel? Like. Um, do any of the strategies you cover, um, even though they cap, cap at yeah. age 15, do you think, um, what do you think you would recommend to people of my age that don't read? I mean, I would say just briefly, it's the same idea. Maybe they haven't found the books that they love. It's hard to, mm. to do this kind of work. That's why librarians I was going to say, exist. I think dates to the National Book Festival. Yeah. I would yeah. be a really good idea. Very true. But, <laughs> and one of the strategies that we talk about in the book that, that was crucial for me is constantly, as you're running your errands, we were always stopping by the bookstore. Just, can we just stop in here for a minute? And then you disappear and they're in the bookstore and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Let the magic happen. Yeah, I bring books to the bars with me. And share, <laughs> what, share what you're reading. I mean, I think we make it kind of yeah. deeper than that it needs to be. You share what songs you like, you share what movie you're watching, what are you binging on Netflix, talk about books. Like make that a normal part of conversation or buy them a book and say, let's read this together. Um, and when I, the next day, we're gonna talk about <laughs> chapter See, three. This is the if beginning you know, of the sequel. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's three yeah. chapters so far. <laughs> One was good. Then, it's true. One other thing I, I wonder, with all the great graphic novels out now for children, we are discovering there's so mm. many visual readers. Your generation didn't yeah. have that. You didn't get That's to right. grow up on you know, Dave Pilkey and Raina Telgemeier and Victoria Jameson and John Lewis, <laughs> right? The March Trilogy. So maybe some of these guys are more visual readers. There are great graphic novels for adults too. Maybe yeah. try that. And, and along with the, yeah. what Renee is suggesting, throw a graphic novel in the mix. And following on from Renee's, the most successful sort of post-millennial book club I know of is the book movie book club. Mm. You oh, read the book of a movie that's coming out. Oh, nice. great idea. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your candor and thank you for the stinky cheese. Yeah. Man, I really. Uh, <laughs> yeah, have to find a guy who reads. <laughs> You're up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for an in very engaged, excuse me, a very engaging panel discussion. I'm a reading teacher. Um, thank so, you. Yes. Thank <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I want to go back to a point you made early on about the purpose of reading. As a reading teacher. I fight with administration because I like to keep it very simple. Our purpose for reading is to understand a perspective or to grow a understanding of a character or how to deal with a problem. And I taught what mama left me um, after a group of student, two students who had had a very similar situation than your book. And one of the challenges with the purpose of reading, I kept it very simple. But the challenge with educators and is that there has to be a very specific purpose. We have to do this and to you know, a point that we don't do it as a way we should just to expand one word. And that's the challenge as an educator because we do have an immense dis disconnect. So my question, I'm sorry, my question is, how can we as educators and looking at authors, what can we, can we look at in your books when we're deciding what we're going to teach that can do both? Do both. Can do both in the sense that Keep it simple, but also give the educators what they want, because I'm telling you, I'm tired of fighting with principals. <laughs> yeah. oh. oh, I like Renee's, like, listen to the kid, like the individual. Mm -hmm. Like, try not to squeeze everybody into that same, same thing. And I know from being a classroom teacher, that's kind of where reading logs came from. You're trying to keep track of where everyone is, yeah. and it's just chaos if you don't. 
But I think there is that way to like let that kid know like you you're seeing what they're reading, and that, and that I don't know that that you do see it. And maybe providing options for how they can engage with the book. So. I think sometimes we make maybe one assignment for every student. Yeah. If the whole class is reading the book, maybe there are assignments you can give that are um, varied so that students can connect with it in the way that they need to, simple or more profound or deeper or, you know, in what mama left me, you mentioned that. You know, there's poetry prompts in there. There's all these other things that I was trying to layer in there so that if a teacher is reading it and doesn't want to focus on the domestic violence and the issue, they can still talk about poetry and teach what is metaphor and now we're going to write metaphor and, you know, so hopefully our books are layered enough that you can choose your own adventure of what you're really going <laughs> to yeah. focus on um, and know that those other things are there if a student is able to go there. One of the assignments I did was they had to design a front page after the murder took place, mm -hmm. and they had to write the first person story. So, yes. So I appreciate your question, and I'm, a, I'm probably a little more pessimistic than Renee and John are. I think you have to change the entire attitude of education administration. <laughs> That's an uphill journey, but you have to get superintendents and principals to see that this is a long game. And if you institute student choice at every single level, I promise you they'll have better test scores at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? Maybe not this term, maybe not this year. But the whole system has gotten so results and test oriented that I don't know how any reading teacher can, you know, instill yeah. a love of reading. Yeah. So thank you for trying. Mm -hmm. And your research supports that. Let's see if we can get one more. Yes. Point. Yes. I have two children with ADHD, so reading beyond the third chapter is an issue. I guess I wonder if like graphic novels and audiobooks and reading to them still count at nine and ten, or do you have any other suggestions for kids who Still count. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And novels and verse. Yes. I want to yep. like yes. novels and verse, yeah. novels and verse, and novels yes. and verse. Yes. Uh, oh, count no, too. And uh, that's a that's a great supplement okay. too, right? So many of the great YA books and more and more middle grade mm -hmm. too are novels and verse. Teenagers are reading poetry and loving yes. it. Kwame it's Alexander. narrative pop right. Yes. Kwame Alexander is you know, on the bestseller list nonstop, Ellen Hopkins, there's tons of ver novel and verse writers. So yes, so novels and verse, but the visual is yeah. really, really mm -hmm. important. Don't give up the visual, don't. And you might have to also oppose some of the educational uh, communities, yeah. ideas about graphic novels. There's a lot of negativity around graphic novels and highly illustrated books, which is, is really sad because these are literary books a visual reader, a child with ADHD, can follow the story better when it's delivered through imagery and words, and that's reading. They're, they're, doing the, they're using all the mm -hmm. same brain functions when they read a graphic novel. So stick with the graphic novels, throw in some novels and verse. And the other thing I would say is sometimes it's hard for a child with an attentional issues to follow a sustained narrative, but not all books are sustained narratives. So you can do things like books like that are collections of, of short, short stories. stories collections of mythology, folk tales, fairy tales, or books that are fact-based, you know, like a huge compendium of science facts or whatever your child is yeah. interested in, to find those kind of those big DK books or National Geographic or whatever their subject is. Joke books are books too, yes. you know, things that you can dip in and dip out of and skip around and not necessarily have to go from beginning to end. Um, I, I'm going to pause for just a second long enough to say I see the sign that says we need to wrap it up, but I also think we're, we're allowed to go till 6, aren't we? Can somebody check their program? Yeah. I don't want to like break the rules or anything, and I don't want to <laughs> like keep you after class, but I love that we have so much interest. So if we can go till 6, can somebody say yay or nay? Oh, good. Yeah, yes. we're good. Thank All you. Right. All right. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> just checking. Excellent. You're up. Great. Hi. I wanted to thank all of you. This has been fascinating from a grandmother's point of view, but also from a brain injury survivor point of view, because I am a medical miracle and I've survived a brain injury five years ago. And when I go to the neurooptometrist, which nobody knows exists, <laughs> it's me and all the five-year-olds that are having reading problems. So I just want to put a big shout out for neurooptometrists. If your kid is having trouble reading, please take them to get checked oh, because it could be that oh, something nice. in their brain is not connecting to their eyes. And 
I was a Washington Post editor for 30 years, and I can't read anymore. My brain won't let me. I have to listen to audiobooks. Mm. Yeah. So your brain does all kinds of things for you. So please take good care of it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, nice. Brain and also, um, other auditory processing. There's other, there's other things that can be in the way, and that very smart kids can game the system a little and fool you. And you think that, that, that their child is having a reading problem. It's actually something more neurological. Mm. So it's, yeah. this, this is good. Or they just mind. need glasses. Or, right, Seriously, they might just I mean, need glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm an upper elementary grade teacher in a school that has institutionalized the 20 minute per night reading log. So do you have any suggestions for either something else to do or some evidence that could be presented as so, an alternative? <laughs> I mean, that's our teachers, and, and we're, we're mostly talking about advice for parents. And I think that framing it as, like, this is a required time is, again, it's turning into something, it, into something that's obligatory and something that's work and something that's school and something that's going to be judged. And so uh, what we did in, in my family is we had a bedtime, and then there was, uh, let's say the bedtime was 7. Uh, but if you want to stay up late reading, you can stay up until 7.30. So it turns reading into something that is a privilege, something that you get to do, something that you, it's a choice. So look, if you're tired, go to bed. Um, but if you want to stay up late, if you want to read, you can stay up. And I think that that just framing things sometimes in a different way, it's the same idea, but you're reframing it so that you turn something from work and something not fun into something, and something that's being imposed upon you into something that's voluntary. And but now for, the, for a teacher, for an educator who is forced to do it, we also have ideas about how a reading log can be transformed into a more personal book about you know, the, the child's own uh, record of what they're reading with their yeah. own comments, or maybe they illustrate it. Something, a beautiful object that is theirs and not a piece of sort of Xeroxed worksheet, you know, that's, that's something that also that you could do. Right. You could say, we're going to make our reading logs into beautiful uh, keepsake like books a reading that journal. you can have, like a journal. It's, not a, it's right. a journal for the rest of your life. Because you if know? it is a log and it's a, and it's a piece of paper that needs to be handed into the teacher, then and it's again, yours. It's, that's something that's the school. Whereas if you're keeping, if you're asking kids to keep a reading journal, that's then theirs. that's something for them. Yeah. So there's little, there are little tweaks you could do if you, if you have to do that, that mm -hmm. I think could make it a more rich experience and that could encourage actual reading and not, you know, clock watching. And choice at being at the heart of it. That's the, right. the thing I did yeah. as a teacher. My favorite period was that drop everything and read. Yeah. And mm -hmm. all of my kids ended up being crazy social readers who traded mm -hmm. stuff. And the other thing I would say is that emphasize, if you do have to do that 20 minutes, emphasize that during that period, they can read whatever they like. It can be yeah. comic books. Yeah, it can Calvin be and Hobbes comic was book, big. You know, comic yeah. strips. It can be graphic novels. Right, no it judgment. Can be a magazine. No judgment. This is your, your reading, it's reading time. More poetry. <laughs> more, yes. more. It can be poetry. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. You're up. Hi, I'm another educator. I'm a literacy and language specialist. I work from birth to um, middle school. So um, I like it when the authors do suggestions for kids to do. How do you feel about that? And then also. Um, when it comes to by the time the children get to middle school, when they're younger, we're all like all about the kid, what they love, what's your interest. <laughs> and it gets lost by the time middle school gets real all about the standardized testing. Yeah. So it's no if, ands, and buts out of it. Unless you're in like a private school or a freedom school, the teachers have no choice. You have to do. So besides the administration need to be changed, like you said, <laughs> what other things do you um, advise teachers to do? And a lot of part of the education <laughs> part, too, is doing a lot of parent environment things with reading because of the scores. So see how to kind of like all have to combine. We have to like meet the administration, but we're still supposed to be free and jumpy like clouds. So, <laughs> you know. In reality, I think that's where you were trying to get at. We know what we need to do, but there's stipulations on what we can do. Mm. So besides, yes, changing administration, you know, and creating a movement, which we are doing, in the meantime, between time, the children still have to learn and we still have to teach. I, I mean, yes and yes. <laughs> um, I think that sometimes it's okay to say that 
to your students in a way that is like, look, we have to do this, but also you are in control of your full education, right? So here's a list of books that I'm reading as your teacher that are just my favorite books or what I'm reading right now, I'm just gonna put that on the wall and you can choose to read one of those on your own time. It's also for me about not just making reading my assignment to you, but hopefully I'm building in you the desire to wanna to do this when you're not with me as your teacher. Right. So I think there's a way, even I know some of you can't control even the books you're giving to young people. There's curated lists and you can't just say here, give them this book uh, because it's great or whatever. So I do think there's still a way to say to a child, but when you're not doing your homework and when you're not having to do the thing I'm assigning you, what are you reading and what are you wanting to learn about? And that's a way of making them advocate for themselves and to say to their parents too, you know, parents, what do you want your children to be reading? And, and, and can you also help us as educators um, kind of push back against the system? So it is kind of doing both at the same time. And I love and respect teachers because you are having to figure out how to be in the system and kind of buck up against that right. system. And I think it's okay for parents to know that that's what you're doing and ask them to get on board with you. And you know, our idea is children need to be exposed to reading in a non-pressurized environment, yeah. an environment that's focused on pleasure and discovery. So it's great if that happens at home, that's ideal. But if it's not happening at home, that can also be that they have a teacher who talks about books in a pleasurable way, who talks about what fun books are, who encourages the kids to, you yeah. know, books go viral with kids. If you see the kids in your class are all swapping, you know, the track series, you know, make sure you say, hey, who's read book two? Who's read book three? You know, keeping those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. going at the same time, which is what Renee's saying, that's all, that's all part of this idea of raising passionate readers, right? That, so even if you're under this school system's uh, you know, more martial approach to reading, you can find ways to just, just by talking about books yeah. with joy and yeah. pleasure. Or do what my third grade gift. teacher did, and that was start reading a really great novel to us mm -hmm. and then stop when we all wanted to know what happened next. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it worked, it absolutely worked. Yeah. You know, that builds suspense. Um, another question over here. Um, I'm a parent uh, of three children who are ahead in their reading levels, and I, I attribute a Reading Rainbow to my love of reading mm -hmm. as a yeah. child, and I wish that something like that could be out now, but since it's not, I say that about my children because I have two sons who attend a middle school. They stress parents reading to them. They also stress that the children read. Um, but I have one son who thinks, oh, I know enough. I don't need to read anymore. I have another son who's <laughs> really into... Uh, graphic novels and he now reads stories through his cell phone and all the tablet and such and my daughter here reads my on books um, through her school in addition to paper books how do I get over that hump with my eldest son he's even like mom why are you even bringing me here to the Library of Congress for book festival? <laughs> this is boring but you, you know I'm thankful that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you all so much for your insight it was just so profound listening to you all thank you uh, I think your son is a hundred percent normal <laughs> and I think sounds very familiar yes yes and I think it's sort of a developmental thing and that uh, as long as you keep reading and keep books an important part of your family's life he's gonna come back okay. yes so um, yeah. you know he just he'll find his own way to do it that is my hope but I really think that I think I got one of those guys at home too yeah. <laughs> let me know if something works <laughs> um, Thank you. yeah but I think again going back to what Renee was saying again about the individual and the teacher um, one I've heard many um, authors who were not readers as youngsters yeah. um, say that it was a teacher who said this book made me think of you yeah. That's it. No pressure. No, no, it's not for it's assignment. Not for school. Yeah, th this book made me think yeah. of you, and that was it. So they're encouraging again the reading outside. You have so much you need to do, you know. Yeah. And and the problem is that all of these strategies that I think of that might help teachers require them to go from 60 to 70 hours a week to mm -hmm. 90 to 100 hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just it's so it's so so difficult, right? If you're going to that's pick fine. out a book that's going to speak to each child as you know them, that's so much work on your part. Well, right? you can but buy I, Razor Reader. I was going to say all kinds of strategies. <laughs> and with that, yeah. I am very aware that the sign actually says wrap it up. <laughs> so we're wrapping it up. Um, I want to let you know that Pamela and Maria will be signing their book in, in line number 11 between 6.30 and 7.30. 
this evening. Um, I know they hope to see you down there. Thank you all for your participation. And Renee and John and Linda Sue and Pamela and Maria, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and Leanne. thank all of you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Leanne.